I mentioned this earlier, rising pesticide residues allowed in our food. Again, you know, the government says, don't worry about it. Monsanto just put out a paper last week, I think, Monsanto Bear, they've been bought by Bear now, that says, don't worry about it. It's fine, don't worry about it. More and more scientists are telling us we do need to worry about it. Uh, the levels are rising. You can see in oats for glyphosate in particular in the 1990s, what was allowed, what was safe, was 0.1 parts per million. Uh, what's currently safe is 30 parts per million. So you can see that's a pretty dramatic rise. Um, wheat, you know, similarly, barley, field corn, you can, there's a very long list you can go down. And, and you see this for all of these different pesticides. If it's important and profitable for a very big company, they're going to go to the EPA and they're going to want more of it allowed so they can sell more of it and volumes can be used. And they come up with all these new ways to use it, like uh, Monsanto's been encouraging farmers to desiccate wheat and oats to spray it directly on these crops shortly before they're harvested um, as a harvest aid. And what happens when you do that is you have a lot of the residue in the finished grain, which is why you see a lot of it in oats. Now, um, the science and the concern is, is catching up to a certain degree. I've talked to uh, some grain handlers, um, Bungie, and there's some big ones in Canada and elsewhere, and they're starting to get it, and they're starting to tell their growers, their farmers, we're not going to take it if you desiccate it with glyphosate. If you spray glyphosate right before you harvest it, we're not going to take it. Um, but still, that's, you know, that's a, a small part um, of what is happening around the world in terms of this being used on our food. So what you see here is, um, this is Linda Birnbaum. This is a paper uh, that came out uh, not too long ago. The point of this is that, as what I said when we began, is that scientists around the world are trying to tell us that we need to pay attention to this, that this is a big concern. And this was a paper that was authored by Linda Birnbaum, who is the head of our US National Toxicology Program and our National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. She's a big wig, she's a big dog. She's considered one of the leading uh, toxicologists in the world. And she's very concerned. And one of the main things is the messaging, what they're finding from the science is at levels that we once thought were safe, the science is now showing us that it's not safe. Um, so you might think these little residues in food or water might be telling us that they're, not, that they're safe, but the science is starting to show us that it's not safe. The most vulnerable populations, she said in this paper, uh, our children face the highest risks. So you might expect that after this paper came out, and there were several accompanying this from other scientists uh, that had a similar message, but they looked more specifically at different pesticides and chemicals, you might expect our lawmakers would sit up and pay attention. Um, but what they in fact did was they got a nudge from the chemical industry and they said, you know what, we need to get rid of Linda Birnbaum. We need to get her out of, out of her uh, job. And they've been after her, um, and she's, you know, been besieged um, and trying to hold on to her job. And, um, you know, she still is speaking out from time to time, um, but, but not nearly as much as you would expect um, because of the pressure on her. Uh, this is another um, study, another paper that came out not too long ago. Um, showing that uh, these, this was focused on glyphosate-based herbicides, um, but the findings are showing that doses that were considered safe before, they're finding that those doses are capable of actually modifying and changing the gut microbiota. And, you know, I think you've probably heard from other speakers, um, what happens in our gut is very important to what happens to our overall health. Um, so this is just, you know, one, one more study saying we need to pay attention this is um, from a group of Harvard researchers um, who similarly, you know, they put this out uh, last year, and uh, they're finding that, you know, consumption of these high pesticide residues is associated with, uh, they were looking particularly at pregnancy issues, and they found that these pesticide residues were associated with probabilities of um, poor outcomes for pregnancies and live birth. Um, so, you know, they also, I've talked to these scientists, and they're also saying we need to realize, and here's a few quotes, we need to realize that these levels that we used to you know, think were safe cannot necessarily be considered safe. It's like chlorpyrifos. Our government told us for you know, how many decades, don't worry about it in your food and water. Well, now we know 
we, we can't have it at all in our food and water. Uh, no level is considered safe because it's so damaging. Um, so they're telling us now these uh, glyphosate is safe, you know, 20 years from now, what are they going to be saying? But you can see here, here's a quote from Linda Birnbaum. Uh, here's another scientist. Uh, these scientists are trying to get our attention. And uh, I'm trying to share uh, that message. This came out, you may or may not have seen this. I don't know if you're all fans of organic food or not, but this was a French study uh, that looked at cancer risk and association with consumption of organic foods. It's been criticized um, quite a bit for different methodology and things, but it, it did find, and this was written in the New York Times, it's a legitimate study, 25% uh, fewer cancers um, associated with eating organic food. So the point of all of this and the point of writing the book and talking to you guys today is just um, not to tell you to you know, eat organic food or throw out your glyphosate or your Roundup. or what. It's just to say we need to pay attention and we need to understand the risks that come with the rewards. And we need balance. I feel like we have lost our balance. We paid attention when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring and when she warned us about indiscriminate use of pesticides and the impacts on health and the environment. She talked about DDT. And we paid attention and we formed, you know, formed the EPA and the modern day environmental um, defense movement. But the point of whitewash is that we have forgotten that message. And we've gotten out of balance. We've swung too far in the other way. Um, and we've become complacent. And we're endangering our future generations. Um, and I love this quote. If I can read it, I know you guys can read it yourself. But if having endured much, we have at last asserted our right to know. And if by knowing we have concluded that we are being asked to take senseless and frightening risks, then we should no longer accept the counsel of those who tell us that we must fill our world with poisonous chemicals. We should look about and see what other course is open to us. And I love that quote. I think it's the greatest quote. Uh, I quote that in my book, Whitewash. But um, I have to say, if you do want to read the book, be forewarned, it's not a feel-good story. Nobody reads it and comes to me and says, I feel great. I'm so happy now, you know. <laughs> People read the book and they say, oh, you know, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I don't know what to eat, I've thrown out all the food in my refrigerator, you know, I'm going to go march or something. So it's not a feel-good story, but I do think it's an important story, um, and I think it, it can help educate uh, people and inform them and, and hopefully get them to understand, um, you know, what we're doing to our food system. And it's, it's not just about human health, it's about environmental health and biodiversity and pollinators and, and sounds very nerdy, doesn't it? It's a pretty nerdy book. Um, but it is definitely the book Monsanto does not want you to read. I have to share this one. They filed a motion in court last summer um, seeking to exclude my book from evidence. So uh, I think that's one of the best selling points, perhaps, of all. I like it. Um, thank you. So if you have questions, we have time for questions. If you don't, you can get out. <laughs> yes, yeah? Do we have a microphone? First of all, thank you so much for your courage, <laughs> oh my gosh, um, and the work that you're doing. Uh, I, I had several questions. One is, my first one is, why don't they just find a non-toxic alternative? <laughs> Number one, I mean, that would make things a lot easier. Right, do you want me to answer that? Or do you want to ask all your questions at first? Because I can, I, they are trying to do that. Okay. Uh, Monsanto has a research program and there and all because they they see the writing on the wall they know this is not sustainable um, you create this weed killer use it over and over weeds become resistant same thing with insecticides insects become resistant what we've seen them do when that happens is they pile on more and more and we're combining glyphosate with dicamba now we're combining it with 2,4-D so the companies have realized you know what this isn't sustainable over the long run, and they're looking for bio pesticides. Um, but in the meantime, they're still selling 
as these synthetic pesticides. And how long has this been going on that we've been using pesticides on our vegetables? Long, 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 long time. Long time. Decades. I mean, months. Uh, glyphosate came in about 1974, um, but decam and 2,4-D are much older. Um, you know, atrazine, we've had a lot of them around, around the 50s. Um, after World War II, the big chemical companies were looking really for other streams of revenue and uh, thought they could put their chemistry to work in agriculture. Mm. I lost my whole family to uh, that terrible disease. I don't even like saying the name of it. My, my mother, my father, and my three brothers. Oh my gosh. And two very dear friends of 30 years. So I'm so sorry. And I have one now struggling with pancreatic and so it's, you know, particularly disturbing. And I have chemical sensitivity. I have a plaque on my dashboard from the city um, saying that, you know, I have this challenge. And um, anyway, so uh, the two qu other questions were, is organic safe? And... Um, what can we do, you know, us as individuals, what can we do besides reading your book? And oh, so organic, I mean, the organic standard, um, you know, for the most part bans synthetic pesticides. So you wouldn't be using glyphosate or atrazine or that sort of thing. Uh, what we're finding, what I'm finding, unfortunately, through research and other people smarter than me already know, I suppose, uh, is that organics still do many times contain, contain pesticide residues. And one very big problem is that there's not enough organic compost, organic fertilizer um, to put on organic farms. So a lot of times so they might be growing organic produce, but they are sourcing their manure, their fertilizer, you know, from something that is not organic, from animals who are not eating organic food and the pesticides are going through their bodies. And, and this is a real problem, but it's allowed um, by our national organic program. Uh, you know, and of course we have pesticide contamination, you know, the, um, our scientists found it in rainwater. So you have it in the water, you have it in the air. Uh, it's very hard to have a completely chemical-free piece of, you know, produce necessarily. But organic would, by virtue of the standard, have, have less generally. Is there any, any vegetables that are safer than others? Broccoli? In, no. <laughs> in any area of the country, the world? <laughs> well, you know, two anecdotes, I guess. One, this is a terrible one. I was talking to a... Um, a consultant, a farm consultant, uh, last week, and he had a client who had been trying to grow organic blueberries here in the United States, and he kept finding uh, his produce was contaminated no matter what he did. Um, so he's moved his growing operation to China um, because he can produce pesticide-free blueberries much easier there than he can in the United States, which seems just outrageous to me. Um, and then he's, of course, shipping them, selling them into the United States. Uh, so strawberries, you ask for ones that have lower levels, I guess I'm talking about higher levels. My, my children love strawberries and want them for breakfast every morning, but I've looked at the government data on pesticide residues and see a bowl can carry up to 20 different pesticides, residues of 20, to, you know, so, um, you know, organic? General conventional strawberries, yeah. So yes, I run around the city trying to find all of the organic strawberries and buy them all up, so. Um, in terms of what you can do, educate yourself. Environmental Working Group puts out a list of dirty dozen, the foods that have the highest levels of pesticides based on government data. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's a hard challenge, I think. Thank you so much. Do you need a mic or no? Yes. If you have a home garden, you mentioned that the rain is also, the rainwater is also producing these chemicals. So a home gardening, organic gardening, you're still getting 
you can. these toxins. You can if you're you know near an area or there's been glyphosate and that you know it depends of course on weather, climate conditions, and use and all of that sort of thing. But it was the U.S. Geological Survey uh, scientists that documented this in uh, in rainfall as well as in um, surface waters. Okay. I had recently called um, Stony Brook to see if they did uh, breast milk testing for glycosate. Uh -huh. And they're not set up for that. And right. I said, wouldn't it be great if uh, they can break down all the chemicals in breast milk? And then these women, if it shows up, can have a lawsuit against all of it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the ways we can uh, do something is making phone calls because I was told that any call that you make, you act as 100 people. So if you get five people calling on the same subject, which I've called our Suffolk County executive, yeah. asking him to, to ban all this stuff on Long Island, um, it makes a big difference. So if people make their calls, it could be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree. Like, you see that happening in communities you know, in, around the country, that people, you get a group together, you go to your city council or your school district, and you say, we don't... You know, we're okay with the dandelions in the schoolyard, you know, but we don't want toxic pesticides. Now, what's happening um, is state and communities that are banning these pesticides, of course, the companies are in Washington trying to get a preemption in the law so that the local communities would be banned from banning pesticides.